Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome and good afternoon as we um, start this sixth episode of the IGF conversation, looking at employment and employability for the Invictus community. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Kate Silverton. I'm delighted to have been asked to facilitate today's event. Um, as some of you may know, I'm a journalist. I've reported from the front line in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm an author and wife married to a former Royal Marines commando. Um, so I have a very personal and professional high regard for and shall we say some understanding of the military mindset and what it takes to serve, and most importantly, what our nation's debts are to you in return. I work now in the field of mental health, supporting families, and I really do understand what it takes to change path, to overcome challenge, and ultimately to prevail both physically as well as mentally. Um, I've worked with companies like Deloitte and others, whom we shall hear from shortly, who proactively seek to facilitate employment opportunities for former military personnel. And I'm delighted that we've got so many companies joining us today in that regard. I'll be introducing you shortly. Now, I know many of you join us today from across the Invictus community, including its 20 participating nations, competitors, really importantly, families and friends too. All of you, very welcome. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the sponsors who made the event possible, ISPS Handa, Ascot Rehab and the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust. Thank you. The IGF conversation looks at all the issues relevant to you now. The use of sport, of course, we know absolutely central and vital to the respective journeys of recovery and rehabilitation. So too is having a sense of purpose, enjoying being part of a healthy, happy family unit, volunteering, serving the community, fulfilling personal ambitions and following our passions. All of these things we know count. We know that really matter. They're the things that keep us going. They enable us to get the very most from life moving forward. And employment too, of course, is crucial uh, when you're ready to consider and seek it again. And I know many of you have had to leave the armed forces before you had perhaps initially planned. So your next stage of employment might well be then in the civilian environment. Now, I know from all those I speak to in this position, including my husband, that it can feel quite daunting. It's a step into the unknown. And it's why we're delighted we have such a talented group and experienced group of speakers here today. Now, their biographies are on the webinar platform, if and when you'd like to learn a little bit more about them and their journey as well, because they offer really important insights and their own experiences on employment, and also in particular for employing veterans. They represent a really wide range of international companies, so they have that global perspective relevant to all the participating nations. Now, in addition, and importantly, some of them also have significant experience in, in employing former service personnel who have been injured. And injuries, as we know, can mean the physical, uh, visible wounds, as well as injuries that are invisible ones, too. So I hope you come away from today with really helpful thoughts. I hope you've been enjoying the exhibition. If you've um, joined us a little earlier, we're going to hope to give you some really practical advice and tips on what you might need to consider if you're considering making that next step into civilian employment. Or for those of you already in employment, how might you then help those who are seeking it? So do enter your questions into the chat room. I always like these things to be as interactive as possible. So I'll be keeping a little eye on my side screen for your questions. So feel free just as we go along in the panel debates, and I'll try to cover as many as I can um, or pick them up in the closing panel. And I know that everyone who's involved today would also welcome your direct uh, messages to them. If you have questions or perhaps just want to slip in the CV, then feel free to do that as well after today. I would now like to hand over to Lord Charles Allen, who is the chair of the Invictus Games Foundation, as well as the CEO of the foundation, Dominic Reed. Over to you. Kate, many thanks for that kind introduction. I'd like to welcome our international audience today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. First of all, on behalf of the Victor's Games Foundation and all of the team, I'd like to give a very special thanks to Kate for her agreeing to facilitate this episode of the IGF found conversation. We're very fortunate to have her with us today. And as you heard her say herself, she has an enduring 
understanding and commitment to the armed forces and a particular understanding of the contribution that everybody on this call has made. It's very special to have somebody who has that level of commitment. So, Kate, thank you very much. We're also very fortunate, as Kate said, that we've got a talented array of speakers who's experienced both as veterans and making that transition from you know to civilian life will be invaluable, I think, in our conversation today. Thank you all for giving up so much of your time. We really, really appreciate it. As Kate said, this is the sixth time we've conducted the IGF conversation, and I get a real sense that the momentum has been building. We started this during lockdown, but I think it has a life way beyond lockdown. It's a great opportunity to have a proper, serious conversation about the issues. It's part of what we call our influence pillar, and the purpose of that is to share best practice, to share personal experiences, and to share how you've dealt with some of the issues that other people are still dealing with and may be dealing with for a while. But it's also not dealing with issues, it's also about creating and dealing with opportunities. I'm very grateful for your input today and also the program for those of you who have helped us with our programs in the past. The purpose of today is really to discuss contemporary issues, the issues you're facing now, but also the opportunities for the future that are relevant to you and to other people on, on this call today. Well, sport really is our primary means uh, to help people move through their journeys of life, through recovery and rehabilitation. As Kate said, finding employment, and it shows us it, at the right stage in this process could be a really important part of uh, helping to build your sense of purpose. And it is very much your sense of purpose. And that's the ultimate aim of today and, and starting this conversation. These conversations never end. They're ongoing daily, weekly, monthly. And basically we find that the foundation has a key role to play in bringing people together who can share best practice and their experience. I hope you get a lot out of today uh, and I'm very much forward to, to, to listening and to learning how we can best help and support the Invictus community, or as I prefer to call it, the Invictus family. It really does have a family feel because a lot of, there's a lot of shared experiences and that's what today is about, sharing your experiences and sharing and listening to other people. And now I'm going to hand you over to Dominic, who is the CEO of the Invictus Games Foundation. Dominic. Thank you very much, Charles. And uh, I'd just like to add my welcome to everybody from, from around the world who's joining us. We've had uh, uh, 200 people register for this, and at the moment the audience is building past 100 quite steadily. So that's fantastic. Um, this is really all about your sense of purpose. It's about the role of employment in helping you find that purpose. Um, I'm not going to recap on the excellent introductions we've had from Kate and Charles. Uh, I'd just like to thank again the sponsors who've made this possible, the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust, Ascot Rehab, the Fisher House Foundation and ISPS Handa. And with that, I'll join you for the final panel that I'm handing back to Kate. Kate. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. So um, the aim of this first session is to look at the current employment market, how it's been impacted by the pandemic, and importantly, where the growth and contraction areas are to help you when considering future employment options. So we're going to cover that first. So a little moment there just for you to see who our speakers are. Again, biographies, um, of course, you can access. But let's get the conversation underway now. And let me introduce our first speaker, Chris. Uh, Chris Reckig, I'm going to turn to you first because um, Chris, Chris and I have worked together before. Um, Chris is a veteran of the British Army, now the partner in charge of the Military Transition and Talent Programme at Deloitte. So Chris, let's give you that big picture uh, question to, to start with in terms of, you know, what's happened with the employment landscape in the past, uh, well, two years, and where are the areas of growth or the key skills that are in demand? Big question for you to begin. Thanks, Kate. I mean, that, that is a huge question. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the, the way that I'd answer it is um, by saying, the, the last two years has put us all in an unprecedented position. Um, there is no question, though, that there is um, globally a, a war on talent um, 
and that is presenting huge opportunities for our service leavers to transition um, into the workplace and um, bring their skills into the workplace right at the time when uh, organisations need it. Um, what's what's intriguing me right now as well is that this um, moment is forcing us to think about the future of work and how organisations are working. Our service leavers, wounded, injured, or sick as well, uh, are all um, equipped with tremendous skills, um, behaviours and values that are relevant today for organisations. And what's brilliant is that um, those people are in demand. And when positioned in the right way across and into organisations, there is huge opportunity today for them to be tremendously successful in, in, the, um, in the environment and, and the employment world. Um, the other thing I just mentioned quickly, Kate, is that, you know, the world that we're in now is now borderless. Um, Organisations are operating globally. Um, and historically, you know, service leavers going into industry would need to operate in a uh, fairly niche geography. That's not the case now. They can operate for a, a global organization from a different geography, and that's presenting huge opportunities as well. So net-net, a lot has changed in the last two years. There is a war on talent. There is the future of work to think about, and there's huge opportunity for our service leavers to continue to add real value to organisations and bring, you know, all of the skills and all of those kind of resilient uh, attributes that they've got into the workplace. And what areas then do you think particularly, as you say, when we're thinking globally, we can think big, but what areas in particular suit veterans? I think there's a whole raft, Kate. You know, if I look at it, I, I, I think of some of the softer skills that people bring, you know, the management, the leadership stuff, we, we, we know all of that, but, 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 but also the technical skills in the, in the cyber space, you know, people are talking about cyber constantly in the resilience space, both personal resilience and organizational resilience. They bring that, you know, we're seeing at COP26 climate having a massive impact. Um, you know, the views, the perspectives, the way our service leavers operate globally um, um, they can bring those skills. Um, we're seeing stress on the supply chain. We've got logisticians that has, that are superb, world class at all of that, um, at all of those sorts of things. So th there are a, a myriad of uh, specific areas where people can bring real value today. Um, on top of all of the management and leadership stuff without actually retraining too much. And, the, the, you know, they, those skills are there ready to be used. And, you know, industry globally needs to recognise those and, and, and draw them into their organisations. That's something I'll pick up with, with John. But do you think industry does recognise the assets that veterans and the skill set that they have. And do you think actually as individuals, and I know we have spoken about it before, in terms of that confidence, in terms of transitioning, what the main barriers are, it's sometimes in, it's in the recognising what, what we bring as individuals into a civilian workplace. Um, uh, so the first part of the question, I, you know, I think, I think we're all getting better at recognising the values that, and, 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 and what, what, what veterans can bring. Um, but there's always more work to do. There's always more education to happen, Kate. And, um, you know, events such as this continue to help evolve that narrative. And it's tremendously important. But organisations are getting better. And there is recognition. And I think just by virtue of who uh, is supporting today, if you look at those organisations and how they're embracing veterans into their organisations, Amazon to name one, um, you know, that is testament to organisations understanding where um, those those skills and um, where veterans can be used. But it, but it can't be just the blue chip companies. It's got to be broader than that. Kate. It's got to go down into those smaller organisations that can take two, three veterans into their into their workforce and help them, um, not just um, 
white collar organizations but but much broader than that but but i think it's getting better and the narrative has evolved and organizations can and are recognizing the benefits i think we're at a unique moment though where uh, veterans could have a material further impact on on society and on and on organizations as it relates to some of those bigger bigger matters that we're grappling with um you know such as resilience and not just individual organization but national resilience the 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 skills that our veterans have they they bring a high degree of um just that x factor that isn't always readily available right and they will run towards the fire always yeah dependability thank you chris for now uh, you're going to stay with us uh, i'll be able to see you in vision but let's bring in john john quintus um john is a veteran of the u.s air force now the managing director of global military affairs at amazon and john you'll have heard chris talking about actually needing to have a global um, ambition, really, in terms of thinking about employability and none more global than Amazon, perhaps. And Amazon really recognises, I think, the particular characteristics that military spouses have to offer. So if you can just elaborate on that first for us, and the, open, uh, the options that are open to that particular group. Thank you, Kate. And thanks for the opportunity to yeah, maybe share some of what Amazon is doing for military families more broadly. And so I'll just open up the question a little bit and maybe give me the opportunity to highlight uh, that it happens to be in the United States uh, Caregiver Month. Um, and you know, very frequently uh, a group that gets overlooked are the military families, the friends and the caregivers that are so critical to the recovery, rehabilitation, reintegration of our wounded, ill and sick. Um, so uh, I, I'll include military spouses in this, but I really did want to focus for a minute about caregivers because, uh, because of the timing of, of the event. In the US, there's over five and a half million caregivers that are so essential to um, caring for, for our warriors. Um, very frequently, um, the, the programs that are relevant to military caregiver, caregivers are actually focused on the service member. Or the, ver uh, or the veteran, they're only incidentally related to the caregiver. And this has consequences. Uh, and so we're learning a lot. Uh, and over the last few years, there have been a number of important studies um, conducted by RAND and others to help us understand this really important community, not only the important role they, they play for our military, but also for society more broadly. Uh, and we're also learning about some of the consequences of the role that they play. Uh, we know through studies now that they, the caregivers tend to have worse health outcomes. Um, they have higher rates of depression. Um, they're, uh, they feel often isolated. Um, and so these are challenges that Amazon and many others are looking to take on. So, so what can be done? Obviously, I mentioned some of the studies being done so we can um, help frame for society the important role that caregivers are playing. Um, so we can begin to understand the impact on the broader family, especially children. And um, there's been a more recent focus on uh, how children are being impacted in the families, as well as military spouses, as you highlighted. Um, Amazon this month, of course, because as I mentioned, it is Caregiver Month. It runs a number of events throughout the month to help highlight the importance of caregivers, expanding awareness of, of their challenges. Um, along with our military spouse hiring programs and our military spouse support programs within the, the company, we do, spay, we do pay special attention to caregivers as well, making sure that we loop them in and acknowledge their, their important role. Uh, what has to be done further? You know, I talked about the programming. The program is really important. Uh, there, are, there are, as we know, uh, rightfully so, a number of uh, government nonprofit programs uh, really focused on supporting our veterans, um, but we cannot uh, treat you know the caregivers as just incidental beneficiaries of those programs. We really should be driving some very specific uh, education and training specifically for caregivers and their unique challenges, their unique skills, their unique roles, making sure that they grow and their capabilities. We have to make sure we create an environment in the workplace that's supportive of caregivers, eliminating any potential discriminatory practice, practices for those that have to care for someone at home. It's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, 
one, that caregivers are younger, that they're caring for younger people, and that we have children in the home during this, and it really does make employment uh, very, very difficult. And then finally, just continuing to, through forums like this, which I appreciate the opportunity, just increase public awareness of the value and the important role of military caregiving. Well, thank you very much for that. And it's an area that I'm now working in myself in terms of supporting families and particularly children. So um, amen to all of that. And thank you very much for what you're doing. And in terms of, um, we, we, Chris spoke about the international, sort of the macro uh, picture for, for organisations and in terms of them placing veterans internationally. Could you just give us a sense of where Amazon particularly considers placing veterans themselves um, and, and give that sort of international sense that anyone watching can think, actually, I hadn't thought about the fact that I might be sitting in the UK, but I could be working in the US as such. I mean, I think one of the important messages uh, really, um, you know, echoing what Chris said, um, we try not to pigeonhole veterans and we try not to stereotype ourselves, you know, that they only fit in certain places. Amazon, um, I think, is a great example because of we have so many different roles available. You know, we are a tech company. Uh, we are a logistics company. We are an e-commerce company. We can do many things virtually and remotely, but there are also many things putting that, that product that you purchase into a box, getting it into a truck, into an airplane, and delivered to your door, all is, is you know, non-virtual work um, that, that we've been able to maintain through the last uh, few years. And certainly one of the challenges that all uh, military service members in transition face is that stereotype that they have, you know, certain skills. So they're all people leaders, you know, they're all going to be really good at leading teams and they are, but sometimes it also constrains what they dream to do. And we have, of course, a lot of veterans who perhaps led large teams, but they dream to be in a tech role uh, and they dream to, you know, to, to get involved in, as was mentioned, cybersecurity, software development, engineering. And um, we do a lot of work to open doors that feel a little bit sticky uh, because veterans can get pigeonholed. So I try to flip this question when I get it. And what are veterans, what are veterans good at? What roles are they good at? They are good. They are valuable on any team. They can do anything. And they, you know, they come from such diverse backgrounds. Uh, the services have such unique and diverse skill sets. Um, I say, you know, they, they are a valuable add to anything. OK, and then let's flip that. I take that point completely. Let's flip it then and ask what might a veteran want to consider in terms of the culture of the workplace that they might be considering joining, i.e. what might be the better fit culture wise? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, when I talk to uh, transitioning service members who seek my advice, culture is normally what I key in on because I always tell them rather than focusing on the exact role that you want to go after, make sure the company is an environment that you feel comfortable in and make sure when you understand your own personal passions and your personal goals and make sure that the place you're going into has the ability for you to, to move and to grow and to attain you know, these lifelong employment um, goals that you've established for yourself. And so uh, I appreciate you focusing on the culture. The culture is really important. I think for veterans, um, you know, I think, you know, what's really important is um, because this is where they've come from, um, a sense of teamwork, uh, a sense of purpose. You know, they, they, they want to be attached to what is the greater good that this is uh, eventually going to deliver to. I think they need a lot of latitude, uh, uh, room to move, uh, because they're going to grow. They're going to learn so quickly. What you find in the military, of course, is you, you can move people, you can put them in any role, and they will figure it out in a short amount of time. They can also get restless and ready to move on to the next thing. And so I think uh, I encourage them to find uh, uh, cultures where there is going to be a long, long runway that has a lot of vertical movement so that they can see a place in three to five years where they can be two levels up, three levels up um, and, and give them the opportunity to grow because we know they're going to excel really, really quickly.
Lovely. Thanks so much, John. Well, let's bring in Will now. Will Eels, who's um, a veteran serving in the Army Air Corps of the British Army, is now Chief of Staff for the UK X Forces Program at FDM. Will, thank you for joining us. Tell us just a little bit about FDM, first of all, and your placement of veterans in technology and financial related posts. Well, good afternoon, Kate, and thank you for having me on board. Um, a little bit about FDM. We are a recruit, train, deploy company, and that's the model that we use. And we we act as a tech talent partner for our clients. Uh, and what, what that means really is that we are, we're in the business of finding talented people. Um, we train them up um, in-house um, to become experts in a particular area and a di particular discipline. And then we put them out in our client base and support them in, in that journey. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we work with a whole load of different people um, in a whole load of different industries. But uh, the one thing that uh, really links us together is this use of, uh, of technology. And, and, of course, uh, there's a big digital skills gap in, uh, in the UK in particular and other parts of the world that we're trying to help plug uh, right now. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, the veterans are, are a big part of what we do here at FDM and, and, and trying to solve that problem. Lovely. And I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So I've got two other questions for you, hopefully, that I can put in. But I also wanted to really explore, um, quite importantly, for FDM, because I know that you do this very well. I mean, I work in the field now, mental health as a counsellor, as someone very invested in understanding trauma and how that manifests in our behaviour, in particular, post-traumatic stress injuries and their aftermath. So how aware are companies like FDM of the impact, potential impact of post-traumatic injuries and what factors might be considered when employing a veteran who's been injured in that regard? Um, I think uh, from, from our perspective, um, we set our X-Forces program up eight years ago uh, and uh, we've been uh, uh, here in the UK, that is, and uh, we've uh, worked with over 650 veterans in that time. Um, we have a number of veterans in-house and I think one of the main things that we focus on is, is making sure that there are uh, people um, throughout our, our business that understand uh, what it means to have been through some of these experiences. Uh, and we are in a position to help um, individuals um, because everyone in my team, for example, is a veteran. Uh, and if if I know one thing about veterans is they, they trust other veterans. They have that shared experience, that shared values, those shared skills that Chris and, and John have been talking about. Um, so there's a number of things we've done in-house to, to make sure that there are, there are no barriers to entry, um, we, we've educated um, uh, our, our non-military uh, staff, if you like, um, uh, as to the experiences of, of the people we're working with. Um, uh, and what we found is that um, because we have a dedicated X-Forces team, we're quite good at um, uh, triaging people to the right um, people. Uh, and that could be a, a third party or a charity or another support organization. Um, but I think we've become a lot more aware in the last uh, few years um, working with this cohort of people. And I think um, we're then sharing that experience and, and, and understanding from other organizations best practice to support that that community of people. But of course, the other thing is um, we, we are open to working with anyone, regardless of their background or situation. And, and I think that's really important that veterans, you know, don't necessarily want special treatment. They want to be treated like everyone else. But it's really important to make sure that they feel welcome and safe uh, uh, and, and trust uh, where, where they're going and, and what they're doing. And part of that is education. Lovely. Thank you. I'm just going to turn to a comment that's been made um, just to reflect back a little bit for all of you. We've only got one minute left on this one, but just lots of lovely comments coming in. One, uh, Peter says, wow, thanks, John, for pointing out the importance of the caregivers that are far too often re relied upon to deal with the aftermath of the crucible of war without the support structure to help them deal with the change in work life experience and stress that comes with it. This is a group for far too long that's been overlooked and underappreciated and who shows tremendous resilience in their caregiver roles so I just thought that was really nice to include before we um, bring this session to a close so um, thank you to the three of you for your contributions and for all that you are doing for the veteran community as well long may it continue thank you very much for joining us thanks Kate thanks thank you. Kate
So we're going to head to session two now, which is shining a light on the Invictus community, strengths and areas for further deployment. We're going to look at the benefits and those skill sets we've been referring to that veterans uh, can offer uh, prospective commercial organisations such as teamwork, resilience, reliability, commitment, and so much more, as we know. Um, of course, we might expect those come out very strongly. But at the same time, I think we also should look at the areas, the skills or the approach that might benefit them from further development. So let's take a look at our panel. So George, let's bring in George then. You've just seen uh, our panel there. And um, George left the British Army in 2004. He's worked in a series of industries, including corporate events, HR and IT, and is now a customer success manager at Salesforce, as well as vice president of VetForce for their military community. So George, let me see if I can see you. You're there. Marvellous technology today. Thanks to all the guys behind the scenes who are sorting all the tech for us. Um, George, then, so let's maybe have a look at some of the more common misconceptions of veterans. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, and I think there's very many. In fact, we're doing a panel about this uh, tomorrow with some of my colleagues. There's some really sort of traditional tropes that come out a lot of it uh, is what people glean through Hollywood films that, well, you you won't be able to lead in a civilian environment because all you can do is shout, you can only follow orders, uh, et cetera. You'll, you'll have heard many of those things before. And, uh, of course, none of that is true. In fact, the military uh, breeds into people a sense of emotional intelligence. I mean, I'm pretty clear that uh, the soldiers in my platoon wouldn't have followed me if I just shouted at them uh, by any stretch. Uh, and, and indeed, that talks to um, a, a transferable skill that comes out, which is that um, part of being uh, in the military requires you to sell ideas and concepts and plans to other people. Um, so, so you're a you're a salesperson straight away. You could argue. And how should a veteran then go about ensuring that those skills are transferable? Because I think when I've worked um, with companies like Deloitte before, when we've done um, looking at uh, veterans work, that it's sometimes a, a matter of confidence, but also sometimes it's selling the story. Um, you know, these are the things that I did in the field, you know, because there's a sort of an idea that maybe it won't translate when in fact it really does. Um, and, and more than that. So how should a veteran go about ensuring that those skills are conveyed in a way that show how transferable they are and understood by commercial organisations. Yeah, there's there's a definite language barrier, uh, and at its at its worst, um, uh, veterans are completely unable to articulate these transferable skills, and organisations are unable to to, to hear them. Uh, there's there's a debate very often about, for instance, in a CV, should you just write it in military speak or should you try and civilianise it? And people can find themselves ending up in in, in a no man's land, I think you need to gauge your audience. I think if you know that the audience you're talking to understands the military, then you just feel free to talk about it, but, but also emphasize some of the numbers, some of the details that can uh, illustrate, uh, and, and as I say, emphasize some of those things that you did. Um, if it's an organization that you know doesn't really have any concept and understanding of the military, you have to do your best to try and, and, and transfer that in, into words that that organization will understand. What, what I'd really encourage people to do is think about the word value, because it means something different outside the military than it does inside the military. Um, you, I, I don't know anyone who joined the military to make a lot of money. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna make you a, a, a millionaire, that's for sure. When you uh, move out into the commercial world, typically, when someone is looking at you sitting uh, across from them at, at, at an interview table, they're wanting to know what value is this individual going to add to my organization? And that's typically they're going to make the organization more money or they're going to drive down cost. Normally, there's a, there's a host of other things that it can be. So you need to think very carefully about what, uh, where you are able to do that. Uh, and, and sometimes that takes, you, you have to think back quite carefully through your military experiences to 
to, to, to find examples of that. I'll just give you one very quick one. My last major role in the military was as the operations officer in Londonderry. And when I really thought hard about all of the organizations that I had to influence as part of that role, there were 20 or 30. It was my own organization, the company commanders. Uh, there was the police there was the uh, air assets, the uh, bomb disposal, all of these different people I had to, I had to influence. And, and that was a skill in itself. Uh, and that's very often what you need to be able to do in, in an organization like Salesforce, speak across many different layers up and down throughout an organization. That's a great example. Thank you very much for sharing that. Stay with us, George. I'm going to bring in Tommy now, Tommy Jones. Tommy retired as a first sergeant from the US Army Signal Corps after 20 years of service, including tours of duty in Bosnia and Iraq. He's now the head of military and diversity recruiting for Verizon. Thank you very much for joining us. Just picking up on that last point um, that George um, made, I, I wanted to ask both of you, actually, but I'll start with you, Tommy, given that I've brought you in now. If you could tell us and describe your own transition, what was your personal experience like of transitioning into civilian employment and where your service stood you in good stead as we've just heard explained yeah thank you kate i uh so i served like you said 20 years on active duty in the u.s army um and uh as i was transitioning out i was you know focusing on a company like verizon i had a telecommunications background so i was really focused in and saying okay well my transferable skills will definitely actually align with what Verizon has to offer. Uh, so I really focused on that, looked at other companies that had you know similar backgrounds, but the location of the company and the, the jobs that were available really looked like they aligned perfectly to me. I went to career fairs, tried to find opportunities and really found out that it was really difficult. Um, you know, the civilian sector didn't understand what I understood about my skill set and what those jobs were. Uh, and I could articulate that to the recruiter, but the recruiters weren't able to articulate that to the hiring manager. And my resume really didn't tell that story. Um, so it was really, really frustrating. Um, I, uh, I, I really got my job here at Verizon by networking. Um, I met a Vietnam veteran who uh, had known somebody at Verizon, had given me an opportunity to actually speak face to face with a, uh, a decision maker. Um, and that really kind of changed the dynamic. And what that allowed me to do is, uh, you know, I did 20 years, like I said, in the signal field or telecommunications world. But here I am now leading an organization in HR. Right. So there it is there in itself is an example of the transferable skills. You know, I managed 198 people. Um, I managed uh, Iraq and Afghanistan signal operations. Um, so managing people um, and, utilize, and and managing their skills and putting them in the right place was actually uh, something that I was really effective at in the military, um, which actually translates to recruiting. Uh, I didn't have a recruiting background in the military at all. As a matter of fact, I had the opposite. I was a drill sergeant. Um, so those skills about understanding skill sets, how to utilize the capabilities that you have within your organization, just like you do in the military, is the same thing you do um, in the civilian sector, right? Uh, so understanding the, the strengths and weaknesses of people, uh, and really aligning them to to really help you accomplish your mission. So that that's really one of the biggest things that I learned is uh, getting face to face with with decision makers, getting veterans to actually get a chance to actually express themselves and have an open dialogue with with hiring managers is a really, really powerful uh, piece. And veterans have to do a good job of really making that happen. They can help themselves so much by doing that. Yeah, that's come up a lot, actually, in discussions that I've had previously here in the UK is, you know, you've got a network, as you say, you can't often sort of, you know, think what well, it's going to come in to me. No, you've got to get out there sometimes and be proactive. What do you advise? What do you advise then veterans then who are looking to join Verizon, given your current role? Yeah, so great question. Uh, a lot of things. I, I think this is transferable to any company. Right. So. If you go on any career site and you find a job that you're interested in and you feel that you meet the skill sets, there's a 99% chance that somebody already has that job and has a LinkedIn profile, right? So my job is, hey, listen, just lift and shift. Take that job title. Say you're looking for a senior network engineer role. Take that, drop it dead center mass in LinkedIn, utilize your skills, and really focus in on those people. We be ple I think the veterans in the audience, you'll be pleasantly surprised that regardless of country that you're in, people generally like to give back their time and like to help other people's advance, right? So if you reach out to them on LinkedIn and say, hey, 
I'm getting out of the, the UK uh, military or I'm getting out of the US Army. And I see this job on here. I see you have a very similar job. I really would like to just have a coffee chat, have a good understanding of you, learn a little bit more about it. What you're doing, you're not only, you know, getting firsthand knowledge for them, but you're also gathering intelligence to kind of redo your resume because there may be things in the conversation that you have with that person that really helps you type that in there and, and kind of makes you focus on here's what they were looking for in the resume. And I mean, the job description, and here's what we're looking for from a, a resume standpoint. And that's going to get you that opportunity to open up. Um, and don't be afraid to not get a response, right? The beauty of it is send, send it to multiple people. There'll be more than one person that has that title. And again, it cuts across other industries as well. Fantastic. Love the practical advice. And I'll bring John in shortly, but just a quick question then just in terms of, and maybe to you as well, George, just a sentence, if you will, both of you, in terms of your own company's veterans program and what value the company places on it. I mean, I, I can start. I mean, we we definitely really focus on that. We really do a job, good job of, of looking internally of the veterans that we have hired and showcasing them externally so they can get the like me mentality. We do that in our own brand. So if you look at our career site at Verizon, you go in there. Every picture of everybody on our military landing page is an actual Verizon employee so that when veterans come there, they can see, oh, there's a field operations manager. She was a sp special um, services uh, military police person, but now doing field operations in, in, in Verizon. It really just kind of showcases where your transferable skills are. And then it also gives you the opportunity to network with that person, to learn a little bit from them. And George? Uh, yeah, very quickly, the Salesforce military program gives free training and certification to serving personnel, uh, veterans and military spouses, actually, that are a very important part of the military community. Uh, and opens up opportunities within the Salesforce ecosystem to all sorts of really fantastic roles. We take it very seriously. Um, Colin Powell, indeed, was on our board of advisors, and uh, just following his his, his sad death, uh, Mark Benioff, our CEO, has given a huge chunk of money to to military charities, and and has uh, sort of doubled down on our desire to get more veterans into Salesforce and, and the Salesforce ecosystem. Wonderful. So what I'm hearing actually is the there could be a bit of advice to say, well, you you interview, given what Chris said a little bit earlier about the war on talent, is that if I'm a veteran, I might actually interview that company to say, well, what is your veterans program like and how will it support also my family um, in recognizing the value that they bring? So let's not be afraid to challenge the um, employer, potential employer. Let's bring in John, John Perez. John served as a U.S. Army and U.S. Army Reserve Officer twice deploying to Iraq. He's now the head of military affairs at Johnson and Johnson, welcome to you, John. Thanks for joining us. Um, you also have at Johnson & Johnson a strong veterans program. So tell us a little bit more about how you prepare veterans for employment in the company. Yeah, so Johnson Johnson, the world's largest, most broadly based healthcare company. And we have veterans that are serving throughout the company all the way up to the CEO of the company. And Chairman Alex Gorski is a United States Military Academy alum um, and, and former Army officer. So we have veterans in roles from uh, field sales and pharmaceutical and medical devices to manufacturing roles to business roles uh, like ones I was in prior to being the head for military and veterans affairs. There's certainly an element of preparation, but I think uh, what I often talk about with transitioning service members and veterans is, you know, there, there are great third party organizations that we work with. So to build off some of the stuff, um, you know, that was just said from, from my colleagues, Yes, there's an element for the companies to play in supporting the transition. But one of those things that hasn't been discussed is how do you work with these third party organizations that are in the business of uh, supporting transitioning service members, whether it's organizations like a Hiring Our Heroes or an American Corporate Partners within the United States, where they're really focused on saying, OK, wh what are you looking to go do next? You know, your aperture is the widest right now as you're making the transition. What type of work do you want to do? What functional domain do you want to go into? What industry? There's other organizations where once that uh, uh, transitioning service member or military family member is looking to and says, you know, what, actually, I want to be in healthcare. I want to be in pharmaceutical or medical devices, but I'm not quite sure you know, what I want to do within that. Great. There's there are still organizations like MedTech Vets, another one that Johnson & Johnson works with, that's going to help individuals on the career. So I, so I think one of the really important things that companies can do is navigate this uh, what's been called the sea of goodwill of organizations that are supporting transitioning service members and military families to help them make that transition to uh, to gainful employment 
and not just into a job, but into a full career. And I, I think, again, one of the really important things to do for a company is to work with these great, uh, in many cases, nonprofits, but not always the case. Sometimes they might be government or academic organizations to help individuals make, uh, make that journey and to partner closely with those organizations. And is there anything else that you would advise veterans individually to think about developing within themselves as they prepare to enter civilian employment? Is there any sort of extra things that we haven't covered in that regard? Yeah, I, I, listen, I think the, the confidence uh, that was discussed earlier, the language barrier and realizing that this is actually more common than you might think. That be, be confident that going into this, this there are precedents for this. Um, and if you think of it more like, hey, I'm switching industries and I'm maybe switching functional di disciplines, people do that all the time, right? People might be in a, in a commercial sales role and then they're going to transition to maybe a more you know, broader business portfolio management role or they're in healthcare and then, you know, they're going to switch to a tech or to financial services or, or vice versa. So if you think of it that way of, Hey, I'm switching industry and functions, but the work that I'm doing is still work, right? Having emotional mm -hmm. intelligence, doing project management work, doing analysis, communicating across different levels, selling and influencing different parts of the organization, different stakeholders. Those are, those are universal um, traits. So, so I think knowing that and thinking from that lens of, Okay, people switch industries and functions. That's fundamentally what I'm doing. My military experience, that industry and whatever functional discipline I was doing there, clearly it's going to transition. It, it was work. And you know, in particular, I might over-index in some skills compared to other individuals. I think if it's framed that way, it becomes less of this overwhelming, um, overwhelming experience. And it's, it's, again, not to discount that in many ways it is because there's a huge cultural shift. Um, there may be shifts in, you know, the the, the uh, value that you're deriving, right? You know, military very much being focused on service to others, but you can you can find that in the private sector. I'm I'm proud to uh, continue my service in the healthcare industry and be able yeah. to make a difference in the lives and the health and well-being of of patients worldwide. That's a great way of looking at it. And in terms of your own transition, then how smooth was it? What what did you feel that you might what you did well, maybe, and and where might things would you have done differently? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I made the transition through a full-time graduate school program. I thought that was a wonderful way. I had come back from about a 14-month uh, deployment to Iraq and, and had a little few months and then started, uh, started graduate school. I thought that was a great time to really um, step back and say, okay, you know, what type of work do I want to do? Where, do I, where can I add value? What's the right thing for my family? Um, so, so for me, that was nice to be able to sort of take a step back. Um, do a little introspection, have some self-awareness on what I would, where I would derive the most value. And then, you know, join Johnson and Johnson. I've been at only one company since that time and, you know, found that, that organization that aligned to my values uh, and, and professional aspirations. And, and it's been a great experience, but I'm happy I had that period to step back. And that's one piece of advice I would always have for the transitioning service member. Take a, take a period of time, take a knee and drink water and, and, and sit there and think and say, okay, you know, what is it that, that is my passion? What drives the value for me and for my family? What, what would I like to go do next? I'm, and I'm happy I, I did that. I love that. I was going to say that do what you love because, you're, and as you say, you'll find that um, you can, and you should be working towards that moving forward, irrespective of whether you, you know, don't think about it just as a civilian thing. It's like, I can still follow my passion. Um, I'll ask each of you for a final point of, of advice, but just another comment that's come in, which I'd like to, Nick Booth and George spoke correctly about value, a key element Oh, it's just shifted. Um, a key element is maintaining a veteran's sense of purpose. This is what is often overlooked and schemes like the NHS step into health or working in the not-for-profit voluntary sector can be overlooked as options. So that's a really good point. Thank you for making that. So a final quick note from each of you, then one piece of advice that you would give based on your own experience of transitioning. Tommy. So I'd say start early and be be confident. Uh, make sure that you're networking and realize that in this world right here, we're not competitive against each other. Uh, so I'm not competing with John or anybody else. We're here as as organizations to help lift the military community and help service members find employment opportunities. Lovely, George. Reach out to the veteran community for help. They'll always be willing to help you and know thyself, I think. Make sure you understand what those values and drivers are and find the right organization for you. And John? Absolutely. The support exists out there. If there is a sea of goodwill, there are wonderful organizations that will support in that transition. It's going and finding those and trusting them. They really are outstanding organizations to provide that support. 
Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. We covered a lot of ground there. John, Tommy, George, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn to session three now, offering advice on identifying and preparing for employment opportunities. So some of the same themes we can continue now. So we're going to look for even more practical advice as we begin the journey of um, identifying and preparing for employment opportunities. A key theme I think you might hear is to start the process early. Tommy just said that. In fact, somebody I interviewed not so long ago said you need to be starting your transition journey on the first day of your employment in the military. So uh, maybe we can have a little look at that but just thinking about the future I think is is the key message um so um also the support that you might need and require from friends mentors or peers again coming back to that point about using LinkedIn and using other people because nobody's ever really going to turn down a coffee or a quick zoom call if it's somebody in another country uh utilize those people that have done you know made those steps before you many veterans have transitioned into civilian life uh it will inevitably be a different experience um, after life in the armed forces, but you can always pick up those tips and tricks to ensure that the transition is a little bit smoother. It does require careful preparation um, to ensure you have that successful transition and that smooth arrival in your new job. So let's take a look at our next panelists. Okay, let's speak to Alex, first of all, Alex Haig, uh, Jr. Alex served in the infantry in the US Army, completing two tours to Afghanistan, specializing in the field of countering improvised explosive devices, IEDs, of course, he's now the, the head of government programs at Better Up. Alex, welcome to you. Um, what did you learn in your, I don't know how much of you, you've heard of the last um, panel debates, but what was your experience then of transitioning into civilian employment and what were the main lessons, would you say? So I had a difficult transition. Um, I was coming off of a 13 month combat deployment from Afghanistan in, in 2010, entered the workforce in 2011 and really floundered initially. Uh, I think that my key takeaways our number one, your transition is a journey. It's not, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, it's a journey and it's not a destination. So manage your expectations accordingly. Um, to think that you're gonna hit the ground running, you know, immediately getting out of the military, I think is not the right approach. The second thing is you need to put on your own oxygen mask. And when I say that, what I mean is take advantage of free resources that are available to help guide that transition. It could be hiring our heroes. It could be breakline.org, but there's a host of organizations out there that offer free training to facilitate that transition. And then the third thing that helped me was finding your tribe. So I read this book, Sebastian Junger, it's called Tribe, but the key takeaway there is to find your group and it doesn't have to be within your new, and you know, your new employer, but find your tribe. And it may not be military. It may be family. It may be friends. It may be a combination but find that tribe, that safe space where you can bounce ideas off as you are going through that transition and people that can give you advice from tough lessons learned uh, as you're navigating that process. It's then, a, it's, sorry, go on. No, the, you know, the final thing is your career is really, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so don't view that immediate transition as a sprint because you can burn yourself out on the front end of your career um, and so I would always caution people to play the long game um, when you're viewing the transition from the military into the private sector. Really great advice, Alex. Um, I love that book. And, and it's so true, isn't it? Is, you know, follow your passions and find your tribe because, um, uh, well, otherwise, what's the point? I mean, we've got to enjoy where we are and to have people around us that we feel that we um, are like minded. And I was wondering, in terms of that journey, veterans that I've spoken to before have also made the point following on from what you've just said is um, 
you know about it being a journey is that don't worry if actually the first place of employment doesn't work out it's you know that's fine you can you can change again so don't sort of have it as a fixed you know it might be that you go somewhere for a year and think this is not for me I haven't found my tribe um so not to sort of feel that you've got to then stay in that one place and I just wondered what were the main adjustments that you then personally had to make that you could share with us I think you hit the nail on the head you are skill stacking as you're going through your career. So if that first job is only a year or two years long, I think it's more a question of leveraging those skills into follow on jobs. So you're absolutely right that don't put pressure on yourself that if that first transition job is not a fit, that you are somehow not equipped for the private sector, you haven't successfully made the transition. For me, I just had to dial it back. So I went from leading over 100 soldiers in daily combat in Afghanistan to being an individual contributor in a cubicle in charge of nobody. And I actually initially made the transition and I had been very successful in the military. And all of a sudden I became a low performer as an individual contributor. I was not, not even meeting expectations. And so for me, it became very difficult. I put extra pressure on myself and it was the more pressure I put on, the, the harder it became for me to perform at work. And so I think I didn't hit my stride uh, until about a year out. And it was a combination of everything. I found my tribe outside of work um, that I could trust and that I could rely on. I took a deep breath and I realized that I wasn't going to be a top performer as soon as I got out of the military, which was fine. Um, this is all about building blocks and this is about a, a 20 or 30 year journey not a 12 month journey. And so what I found was when I didn't force it as much and I let things sort of come as, as they would, things got better at work. And I had been on a difficult team um, for the first 12 months. And then all of a sudden I went onto a team and everything just fit in perfectly. My skills aligned perfectly to the opportunity. And I slowly but surely started to hit my stride. There wasn't a magic day where everything clicked. I don't think there ever is for a veteran. But I think slowly and surely, you know, I just started to see signs of belonging, for lack of a better word. I felt like I belonged at that employer. I felt like I belonged on my team and that I was that I was providing value. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your honesty. I think it's really important to hear those sorts of experiences, because for somebody else who thinks it's just going to be a smooth one and actually that's OK, just take a step back. And can I ask, did you did you reach out to anybody at work in that regard or was it the support that you got from um, friends, your tribe, as you put it, outside of work? You know, did you share that you were not so happy and maybe sort of, um, you know, that first year wasn't so great? You know, I actually did something different. I realized that at that particular job, I, I had not been paired with any veteran within the uh, company to help ease that transition. And so I started from scratch uh, a veteran transition program where every newly hired veteran in that company would be paired with a veteran that had been there for at least a year and could serve as an informal advisor sort of outside of the, the formal performance management process. And so for me, it was more, let's learn, you know, from my bumps in the road and let's create a mechanism so that the next veteran that joins this company has a, you know, a smoother onboarding process. And so for me, that became very cathartic to be able to stand up that organization to, to help the newly hired veterans within that company transition more seamlessly. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Thank you. And thank you for doing that as well. Um, I'm sure that's going to inspire other people to do the same. Um, great. Well, stay with us, Alex. I'm going to bring in Scott now, Scott Baker. Scott completed service in the US Army. His expertise is in leadership and organizational behavior. And he's now a principal consultant on the People Insights team at Better Up. I just wonder what you think, reflecting on what Alex has just um, shared and uh, in terms of support, I think, in, in what a veteran should seek um, and, and where from when preparing, but also in terms of Alex's story, perhaps when they're in an organization and perhaps not feeling that they're, the, they're sort of in their best place. Yeah, I think, I mean, such great, such great experience and insight from Alex. I, I think one thing I'll add is, you know, as he says, it's a journey and the first thing might not work out. So one of the key mindsets and, and places that we have to occupy is, is, believe it or not, one of humility. And, you know, when I was in the military, it was, uh, you know, my pack weighs more, I can run faster and I can do more. And it's just this, 
you know, always wanting to be out front and, and you almost put your armor on and, and you realize that you go from that. And I, I, my transition was back through university. So I went to school uh, and I was in remedial classes because I had lost these skills and, and what I realized is that I have to, to recognize and, and, and practice humility on a daily basis. And I'm a scientist by training now. And of course, we know that empirically is that the people who learn the most from their mistakes uh, are actually humble. So we have to, to be able to shift into that space so that we can take advantage of the journey and reflect then on these experiences that we're having and then be able to readjust. If we approach it we're in the mindset that too often we have uh, in the military of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to put more weight and I'm going to work harder. Uh, oftentimes we're going to run into the wall and bounce back and, and not learn as much from the experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're reiterating that, you know, in my work as well. It's that ability to be um, humble and, and also vulnerable, actually, mm -hmm. to say things are not, not working. There's a huge strength in vulnerability. And I think um, that's perhaps not something that we tend to associate when we might. I know from my husband's experience, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. it works. And uh, Alex has just been a, a great, uh, you know, sort of demonstration of that in terms of the strength that comes from reaching out and then saying I'm going to change things because this this wasn't about me this is about the sort of the system as it were um how how do you think veterans maybe who are watching and 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 also employers what where do they get things right where do they get things wrong and in terms of the mindset I, I, is that a an okay question to ask. I'm trying to get my head around that myself, but do you see yeah. where I'm going with it? You know, if we, if we need to shift our mindset, what might it be from your perspective? Yeah, I think that, you know, there, there's a couple of things. One is, is what we have to shift the mindset to is, um, you, you know, so often in the military, right? We, we, we take orders. Um, and, and that's a different mindset in terms of saying, you know, yes, sir, I'll go get this done to, actually having the mindset of being much more proactive in terms of creating what the future looks like. So, so if you kind of come into your new career and everything with the expectation that, that I'm going to get clear direction and clear order, orders about what I need to do, um, oftentimes you'll be left wanting, right? And, and probably even a little bit rudderless sometimes because it just tends to work differently. So you have to be able to shift your own mindset uh, to be able to say, how can I actually craft and create what it is that I want to experience in the future. And, and then you actually then have to have a role in terms of communicating that to others. But what that really does open you up for it and it ties right back into humility and vulnerability is when you have more responsibility for taking these, you, you're more likely probably to take mistakes and you're going to feel the responsibility of those mistakes and errors more than if somebody were telling you what to do, because then you can kind of externalize it towards them. So taking over that responsibility and then being willing to learn and reflect on the experience in a very humble way is just fundamental to, to your journey or, and, and your evolution really uh, within the civilian world. Lovely. Thank you very much. Let's bring in Angela, Angela Forbes, um, who's had a career in the building industry, including in the charitable sector, providing for essential social housing. She's CEO of Buildforce, designed to support former military personnel to transition into careers in construction. Angela, thank you so much for joining us. You're very um, welcome. Uh, just reflecting on some of the points that we've been hearing, and I'm very keen to, to hear from you in terms of how you support veterans to achieve that soft landing um, and to make sure that once they arrive in their new jobs that then things work out um, well as well. So we heard great things there about mindsets and, and career path and, and navigating your way through this space and then you get that job offer. So the onboarding process starts with your employer, you're sitting there in your new role in a new sector with new vocabulary and processes. So the soft landing that we refer to is the, the contributing factor from this whole experience being a, a short term interim job to being the sustainable second career of choice uh, for the rest of your working career. And in terms of how we create that, there's two key aspects. There's the employer's responsibility here and that of the veteran. So the analogy that, of the transition that we sometimes use is this aeroplane coming into land and tends to soft landing. It's a process, it's a journey, it's planning for that successful soft landing, probably whilst you're still serving rather than moments away from hitting the runway. And first off at Belfast, what we had to do was showcase 
the great career opportunities within our sector of construction. Um, our industry needs these high quality resources. We are competing for skills and labour. So we had to raise the profile of our sector. And it is ongoing as, as, as new generations come through. But build force is where you would come for work experience and industry mentors and employment opportunities and mental health support. Its function is to allow the service leavers and the veterans to access industry. And with the, the hundreds of industry employers that we support, it started with heightening their awareness of the military talent pool and supporting them in retaining and growing our service leavers and veterans. And we share hundreds of success stories and case studies, reminding industry how senior and successful these veterans now are as they sit on leadership teams on PLCs or, 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 or MDs of SMEs. And we support these employers upskilling their staff to be mentors and coaches. Um, we co-write training plans for them so that these veterans and, and service leavers coming in um, come into a, kind of a structured programme and it takes a team effort to get that right. And we need to ensure that the employers are creating that safe space that, that was referenced, this military community or hub or tribe, um, with each veteran receiving support on, on performance targets and development plans. And the landscape's new for them, but their ability to, to thrive and progress is one that they are comfortable with. Um, and it's important having that personal HR contact or senior sponsor whose responsibility is checking in and taking care um, and making sure that, that some veterans will fly quicker than others, but there's always someone there. Um, and as they say, if, if you look after your staff, they will look after you. So industry needs to play its part in recognizing and pulling in this talent pool. And then running in tandem with this is the journey of the veteran. So of those we support, many states, their reason for leaving is centered on family. So the family unit needs to transition and so that new career needs to focus on location. That's very important to them. Or achieving a work-life balance or being home of an evening or having a career that's, that's challenging but not stressful. So the changes the service leader and veteran is making in their life is what we need to respond to. And then an important part of that process is asking what they enjoy doing. What are you good at? What's your strengths and your passions? And give yourself months, um, if not years, to test it, to bring it to life. You need to know an employer's culture to know if it's right for you. You need to be in that environment to know if the role meets your expectations. So do the placements and the site visits and open days and get mentors. And then just back to the analogy to, to close it off, the employers need to create that runway to invest in it and maintain it and grow it. And then the veterans, the plain almost, they need to be coming down steady with their eyes open and their target in mind and, and relying on their military skills has been mentioned for any turbulence or, or change in direction, as Alex says. So it is a partnership probably long before the two have even met, but it does take both parties to, to get it right. Thank you very much for that. And on that, then I'm going to bring in Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Normington. Stuart's part of the senior management uh, for Verizon, uh, their talent acquisition team. And just coming back and following on from what Angela's just been saying, Stuart, in terms of, because you were very closely involved, I think I'm right in saying, in interviewing veterans for posts. And so let's take it back to that point then in terms of what advice would you give to the best, giving a best presentation of themselves and what they have to offer? Sure. So I think one of the things I made sure I did um, when I before I undertook this um, piece of work really was to understand from veterans that have joined the private sector what they wish had been in place when they joined, what what they found that was missing, advice wise or tools or anything like um, like that. And then we decided to sort of launch a bit of a mock interview process with some veterans to take them through what a modern private sector interview process is like. And I think my main advice would be don't focus on what you don't think you what we think you don't have. Focus on all the skills you do have and what, what transferable skills those are. So I would say without exception, any 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 manager of an, an ex veteran will say they're probably the most reliable member of staff in their team, the most passionate, the most committed. The one thing that I found was a common theme across all the interviews and i think this is a real key one to focus on is is perhaps the soft skills i think 
in in business in private sector sometimes you're managing a project where you don't have management responsibility for those people in your virtual team <clears throat> and when you ask these guys you know generally speaking if you're not getting what you need what do you do and the initial response was escalate and that's generally not the way to without you know using a common phrase win friends and influence people in the business world you know they that's one of the things to work on is just, just trying to understand how to manipulate the people that are are working in your area without running roughshod over them but i think you know some of the things that people have said they wish were in place was ad advice around cvs you know what does a for instance a competency-based interview look like and that's very much around a you know putting your best foot forward you'll be asked questions like think of a time when you and what the interviewer is looking for is your actual experience in doing the task you undertook they don't want to know what your team did they don't want to know what you would generally do they're literally after live examples of how you handle situations around conflict or team management or what you know whatever it might be um so that's one key thing to take into interviews do your research on the company there's nothing wrong with going on the social media platforms like linkedin and you know linking in with veterans within that organization and saying to them hey tell me a little bit about the company you know it's not cheating it's it's doing your due diligence uh it's understanding what you're getting into you know even to the extent of looking up the people who will be interviewing you and just knowing a bit more about their background again it's not uh, you know you aren't spying on them you're you're trying to understand the situation you're going to put yourself in and really make sure that you're as well prepared as you can and then you know look at the look at the job description for the role you're applying for um and you know, don't tailor your CV to it. Make make sure your CV is still the truth, but make sure that it's 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 tailored to the role that you're applying for. You know, you can absolutely make little tweaks here and there to make sure that you put your best foot forward. Um, and then connect to people on LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn is is a very um, under undervalued tool. I think in the industry, people think it's just a, a sort of way of finding people. But I would say we we probably hired eighty percent of all of our staff last year through LinkedIn. Um, so it's all about networking and knowing people. And then I think back to Scott's point he made earlier, you know, once you do land that job, you know, make sure you give yourself the best possible soft landing, you know, try and seek out the, uh, the other veterans within the business. And, you know, most companies have got employee resource groups around, you know, whether it's LGBT or BAME or ex-veteran, and you, you get to kind of share stories with like-minded people. And understand from them you know how they've navigated their way into the private sector world um and you know yeah there is support there you know companies are very aware these days of providing support for anyone joining from any any um sort of part of the sector um, that that may need a bit of a, a bit more of a soft landing so yeah as i say just just prepare yourself as well as you can um and that goes down very well during interviews generally Great, thank you. I'm going to bring in Tim shortly, but just a quick comment that's come in, which which um, it relates. Uh, George says, just he said, in terms of humility, yes, in its place, but be careful of it if it's overdone. I see a lot of veterans struggling to talk about their strengths and achievements at interview because it would have been seen as bragging or showing off in a military context. And he says, your achievements are extraordinary, so get comfortable talking about them and it's a really good point i think to make let's um bring in somebody who is also extraordinary tim tim bonke tim served in the uh, u.s army was injured in 2005 by a bomb blast in iraq he's preparing to represent the u.s at the forthcoming invictus games in the hague in april 2022 lovely to have you with us congratulations firstly how's um everything going training wise oh really good uh it's it's you know, it's been uh, unfortunate that we've had to postpone uh, the 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 games, but um, you know that that's still a, a carrot that's dangling in front of me to keep in shape and you know keep all my keep all my training and my fitness up. So, um, which is great. You know, that's that's really important for you know those of us in the wounded, injured, ill community that um, you know that recovery process, keeping fit and healthy lifestyle is is extremely important. Indeed so. And let's talk about that. And in terms of your experience as an injured veteran in transitioning out of the armed forces, what's been your experience? Yeah, you know, really, if I could, if I could pull out a magic wand and just give, you know, any, any of us in our community, uh, you know, probably a one to two year opportunity to 
after after they you know complete their service or, or medically retire as it was in my case just to go through and have some great mentorships um, a lot of explorations you know more more of like a, you know do an industry dating right you know try try out meet some folks from the corporate sector uh, potentially do an internship learn about it learn about what government service could look like the nonprofit sector uh, the trades, you know, because there's what what happens when you come out the other side of a, you know, being severely wounded, injured, ill is, you know, a little bit of that concept of the phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, in, my, in my personal opinion, or in, in my experience, I spent a lot of time, you know, when I came out the other side, trying to prove that I was the same person, that you know, that I could, I could just get right back up off the mat and, you know, push through and try to achieve the things that I wanted to before I got wounded. And with time, now I can look back and realize I, I'm not that, I'm, I'm a different person. Um, I've got, a, you know, a different, um, you know, some of the same skills, but um, a lot of new perspectives and, um, you know, a whole new for me, you know, having lost my leg and having some physical injuries, uh, you know, a new body, but then also a new, you know, mentally and emotionally, um, a new mind. So I did have to go through a little bit of uh, some bumpy roads to figure out where would be the best place for me. And uh, it, it, it did take time, but I, I do wish, you know, if I could go back, I, I would have loved to have had a little more time to explore different parts of, um, you know, kind of, like I said, kind of like industry dating. And, and I, mm -hmm. and I see that with a lot of, um, a lot of people in our, in our community that have, uh, you know, struggled at, at, and, and not just for, you know, cause people, you know, those, those who have left the service, um, just in general without, without, a you know, having gone through being wounded, injured, ill struggled to, go back in as, as, as has been mentioned. Uh, but our struggle is even, even more so it's, it's, it's greater. And, you know, we've, you know, in, in my experience, I'm, I, I wasn't as flexible as, as I thought I was. And I really had to find uh, that really good puzzle piece fit as opposed to prior to being wounded. Hey, I can fit in there. I could flex. Um, you know, cause we, we have to do that in the, in the military, especially, and, and especially having been in, in a combat situation in Iraq, it's all about adaptations and flexibility and, um, you know, that, that works. We have to do that in the military, but you know, you, on, on the, on the flip side, when you come out of, you know, your, your recovery and you're ready to go back into the workspace, it's more important to find that really good puzzle fit in, in my experience. And was there any one thing that helped you to do that? When you reflect on it now, what was the biggest thing or the best thing that helped you in that regard? I mean, I mean there must have been many, I'm sure, but I'm just thinking in terms of advice, specific advice to, to help people to be flexible, even when things feel pretty inflexible. Oh, boy, I would say I think I really came into my own when I accepted that I was a different, you know, a, a, it's a new version of me. And, and, uh, you know, that, that helped me. So I wasn't trying to fit into something and I wasn't really trying to prove that I could be the same person that I was before, you know, once I gave that up and, and just kind of had like, you know, what, it didn't just happen in, in one instance. Um, but I, I just did realize that I, I'm a new, you know, I am, I'm different and that's okay. And, um, I have to, I have to be honest with myself in this new version of who I am, uh, in order to, um, succeed in the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, lots of lovely comments coming in and thank you to all of you who are watching. There's a quick one just before we bring this particular part of the panel to a close, but um, Davey says, nice shout out for Step Into Health. That was a little bit earlier. Uh, do check it out. This is for the UK, I think. Check it out if you're looking for guidance and support transitioning from the UK armed forces into the NHS. Don't just think about medical roles. Do think of the leadership, management and resource allocation skills needed 
needed to effectively deliver different aspects of healthcare. And of course, that might be UK specific, but as we've heard and from Angela as well, but there are likely many other global organisations as well. So I think it is important for us all to just for the moment, as we've heard from so many of you on our panel, is just that little bit of flexibility, take a step back, take a breath and just explore whether it's on LinkedIn or these different organisations, all of whom are really wanting to help. Thank you for that particular discussion. Um, I'm slightly running over and I'm aware of everybody's time. So I'm going to say thank you to our closing panel. Um, I think we're going to be joined uh, by a number of our previous speakers, if I can see everybody. But um, let's also say hello and welcome to David Richmond now, the Independent Veterans Advisor to the UK Government, as well as James Cameron, CEO of Mission Motorsport, the Forces Motorsport Charity. Um, David, uh, I've worked with before, David, the founding director of the Office for Veterans Affairs, uh, before moving, as I say, to become the UK government independent veterans advisor. saw on the screen there that we are going to be joined by Chris again, uh, John and Dominic, and also then to welcome David Richmond, um, the founding director of the Office for Veterans Affairs before moving to become the UK government's independent veterans advisor, and also James Cameron, uh, a former major in the Royal Tank Regiment since 2012. He's run Mission Motorsport, the force's motorsport charity, harnessing the power of sport for wider good as driving the work of the charity as well as what driving the work of the charity so let's bring David in first David very good to see you so David just I, I mean I don't know how much of that you've had a chance to um uh listen of the discussions that we've had I just sort of wonder if you can give us your perspective of what you've heard I think there's there's so much of what I've heard over um the course of this afternoon that really resonates in conversations that we've had before you know that sense going all the way back to the one of the early comments was about that sense of purpose and belonging um, being so important uh, to people, and I think part of that for me is 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 also the sort of um, a bit of homework and research on yourself. You know, who, understanding who you are when you leave the uniform and the rank behind, uh, and you step off into the next part of your of your career. Uh, and I think you know, uh, um, Angela, I think mentioned at some point, uh, at one point rather, you know, understanding your passions and your values and your motivations, and all those things start to help when you do your research into the sorts of industries or the sorts of things you, you'd like to do um, and you know, the organization I know that Angela runs so successfully your build force you know, they, they're great at giving you an insight into things that into employment in the construction industry which really shines a light on the fact you don't need to be a plumber or, a, or an electrician or a, or a plant operator to work in construction. You know, they, everybody from logisticians to chefs to security to project managers to tradesmen, all these sorts of things all come through. Um, so there's been so much actually that's been mentioned this afternoon already that has resonated. And I think part, part of it, which was talked about right at the end, is getting over, and I, I sort of interpret it as, is, as a service people we have to, when we become veterans, get over that cultural discomfort of talking about I rather than talking about we. Uh, uh, but equally, and I completely, I'd be an absolute advocate for that, you have to get over that discomfort. It does cut across the grain. It goes against the grain. Equally, though, I'd say to employers and industries, you've got to work out which end of the stick you want to hold because you can't advertise for team players and then criticise people who talk in team player language. You've got to work that out. Um, mm. And um, so I think there's a bit of both in there. But actually, in summary, there's been an awful lot this afternoon that really resonates. Yeah, lovely. And let's bring in James on that then, James Cameron. And just talking then, picking up on what David just been saying, how important is it to have a network of veterans and peers to support you when thinking about the transition and indeed when you're there? Uh, absolutely. Um, establishing that network and then using it to your benefit um, is incredibly important. And it's not something that necessarily comes naturally to those who've served. Um, and it's starting to have the confidence, you know, um, Tommy at Verizon talked about um, having the confidence to reach out and network and, and go and find people in order to, to experience what that industry is actually like. Um, it was the Invictus Games really that helped the, uh, you know, the presenting partner 
um, Jaguar Land Rover to kind of formalize what they were doing in the veteran space and to start to engender community so that there is now veterans community that, that works within there, but it's also engaged to helping others to come along afterwards. And if you can reach past the intimidating um, faces and some of the language and the mechanisms and the tools which they use to gauge quality and go and find the veterans that work within that organization, you will find them, as all of the veterans on here have been talking about, um, really keen to be able to help others in after them. And having the confidence to be able to do that so that you can understand what it's really like to be a civilian as we all go on that journey as you leave the services. Um, you're not the first one to do it. Others have gone before you and they've trodden that path. Go and find them in, and engage their support in being able to uh, to be dragged along after them. Um, building those communities and then putting yourself in a position where you can help others. We've heard from a load of people who are doing exactly that um, and, uh, and are very confident that whole generations can follow them too. Yeah, lovely. Any final thoughts or suggestions? I'm going to bring in Dominic um, very shortly, but just any final thoughts from from either of you in terms of your own experience um, uh, in the workplace and what you've learned? Any tips, practical tips or tricks? Oh, I th yeah. I mean, it's the reflections are it's never easy. You know, I I think I it was 26 years before I was finally finally left. It's not. It's not easy. It takes. It's a bit of a gulp moment, isn't it? As you leave behind everything you've know, you know, and you step off into the unknown, or the relative unknown. But I think the things that I did well, I hesitate to say, is I as I spent a huge amount of time having a coffee with people. Um, that networking thing. It, networking isn't necessarily about walking into a room of people having a cocktail who all stand and stare at you as you wander in. You're just phoning people up, arranging to go and have a coffee, spending time, letting them know that you're you're about to be around as a as a, and looking for a role, and understanding the organisations they work for and some of the challenges and some of the pitfalls, and really working the network because I think. In service, people network. You just don't talk about it in those terms. You network mm. all the yeah. time. That's how the organizations work. It's why the, that's how the messes work and the wardrooms work. Um, but then when you step outside, you take your uniform off and you step outside, people seem to get all sort of, ah, about it. You don't need to be. If, if you phone just about any veteran up, whether you know them or not, they will help you. And if they can't help you themselves, they probably know somebody who can, and they'll put you, put you in touch. And I think that's probably the biggest thing I did well uh, in my transition. Yeah, Lovely. whole wholeheartedly. I think there's, I mean, it's a bit terrifying when you look and think, what am I professionally qualified to do? Uh, drive Challenger tanks. And then you look for jobs driving Challenger tanks in Civvy Street. And of course, they're, <laughs> they're, they're quite few and far between. Um, but there are so many jobs and opportunities and careers and roles for Challenger tank drivers and their families. Um, uh, uh, and just uh, having uh, the confidence uh, to go and exploit that. And James also that following the passion because you know tanks to what you do now. I mean, you know, slightly different speed wise, but you know, yeah. it's, it's 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 what's in you, isn't it? It's it's kind of what you led you to become, um, you know, to to you know working in the Royal Whole, Tank Regiment in the first place. Wholeheartedly, and yeah, I don't know what makes you think that I like cars, um, but uh, nice backdrop, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, it's my shed I built in the lockdown project, and I I, I get a little tank which I'm allowed to drive around my <laughs> desk and um, you know in my new pseudo office. Um, which occasionally David comes along and, and secretly when I, when I, he thinks I'm not watching, I've seen him playing with it, but that's the same for all infantrymen. You know, they all aspire to better things, <laughs> better things lie ahead of all of us. We can, we can all lift ourselves up. Lovely. Well, thank you to both of you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dominic uh, shortly. Dominic Reed, of course, CEO of the Invictus Games Foundation. Um, I'm so delighted to have had everybody here with us today to discuss employment and employability for the Invictus community. And I'm really genuinely looking forward to seeing how the IGF conversations continue to develop and to bring this, this wonderful international community together. So goodbye from me. Thank you so much for your attention and for joining Good luck to all of you um, in whatever you're going to do moving forward. I will hand over now finally to Dominic, uh, CEO of the Invictus Games Foundation, for his final thoughts and reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. It's, it, it, well, it falls to me to, to thank everybody again for, for a fantastic session. <clears throat> I think it has been uh, very illuminating. I, I've heard a, a huge amount that I've absolutely uh, chimed with. My... Um, my transition, if you like, was a long time ago after a very brief time in the military. But it, it's something that is that whole essence of culture, where you come from, who you are, knowing who you are, 
finding your sense of purpose, all these themes just keep coming through. I think it's absolutely valid to say that uh, most of us are flattered if we're asked to help. And I think that's, that's a fundamental response that most people will have. If you want help, ask for it, you will get it. And if you can't help immediately, you'll try and rack your brains to find somebody who can. So I think that's all absolutely spot on. Uh, and I think also something that perhaps hasn't been said, allow little glimpses of your old self to come through. You're not going to change. You're not actually going to turn into somebody else. And so those moments where you do see the old service man or woman uh, uh, peeking through there, I think that's, that, that, that's an appropriate and important part of it all too. So thank you all very much indeed. I'd like to, I'd like to thank again uh, the sponsors who've made all this possible. Armed Forces Covenant Fund uh, Trust, Ascot Rehab, Fisher House Foundation, and ISPS Handa. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody who's joined in and been part of this. And please, please uh, feedback your thoughts. There'll be a survey coming to you up at the end of this. Uh, so do let us know how it was for you. Let us know how we can improve it. And, very, and hopefully you'll be able to join us uh, for the next iteration, which will be a live face-to-face -face conversation in The Hague. It's what we've uh, we set the whole scheme up to do uh, before lockdown. But uh, in, in the intervening period, we've put on another six episodes of this and I think it's really taking us somewhere so if it's been helpful to you let us know if there's more we can do let us know that as well thank you very much indeed for being part of the conversation today